I think we're going to try to start. I hate to be between everyone and lunch. Um, and if you know anything about me, we will not be late for lunch. Um, we're supposed to start at 11 minutes after, and it's, it's that. So I'm going to go ahead and, and begin. Thank you for choosing us. Um, <laughs> amongst the other options that you had. Uh, my name is Michelle Reba. I'm a research hydrologist with the U.S. Department of Agriculture's <coughs> Agricultural Research Service. Um, my partner today is Merle Anders. Um, he's a private consultant, uh, formerly from the University of Arkansas, and this is his logo. We came up with it this morning, so um, he'll, he'll hear more, you'll hear, hear more about that, I'm sure. Um, this is a, a schematic that I came up with uh, while I was working on this talk for last year, and it really kind of tells a nice story. And for those of you who were in the general session this morning, Jason Kreutz did a really nice job of kind of setting the stage. Um, he used this image, um, and we're going to kind of make our way through this with a real focus on groundwater decline, kind of giving you some more specifics <laughs> about some of the things that Jason talked about this morning. Uh, we'll spend a little bit of time here and here, but really we're going to ultimately end um, talking about alternate wetting and drying and how that as a practice um, is something that uh, we've been looking at uh, long and hard and what we've, what we've discovered from that. Um, we irrigate a great deal uh, in the Mid-South. This is an image that uh, shows one dot equals about 10,000 irrigated acres. Um, so you'll notice uh, the Mid-South here. Um, these are some images, these are some numbers from the 2012 census. Um, the numbers below are from the 2007 census, and um, one of the things that is noteworthy, um, in the 2007 census we were number four, in the 12 census we, we pushed Texas out of the way and, and became number three, uh, still behind Nebraska <coughs> and California. Um, so looking at, at the four largest irrigators, uh, we see something real interesting. Arkansas continues to increase. As we look at the, at the, the census is done every five years, and uh, we see changes from between those five years of very positive, uh, less than 10% in Arkansas. What we see most everywhere else, except for early on in, in Nebraska, are real reductions in the, uh, the, number of, the numbers of uh, acres irrigated. This puts that into context uh, for the change from seven to 12. A red dot indicates a thousand acre decrease. A blue dot indicates a thousand acre increase. What do you notice about the Mid-South? We got some red, sure, but we have a whole lot of blue, right? So we, we really see an increase. What do you notice about the Western US? Uh, we see a whole, lot of, a whole lot of reductions in the amount of, of acres irrigated. Um, Breaking that into the different states that make up the Mid-South, uh, we see those real consistent numbers from 2007 to 2012, uh, increases of about 21% in Mississippi. Um, Arkansas is holding steady at just under 10. Uh, Louisiana is increasing, Tennessee is increasing in, in a big way. Uh, we, we see that in this area, we're irrigating more and more. But the thing about, about that is that we need, to be, we need to be doing that a little bit smarter uh, because of this. Uh, this is an image from 2015 from the uh, Arkansas Natural Resources Commission. The next several slides will come from the Natural Resources Commission, who um, every year, once or twice a year, they inventory, uh, I believe it's about 300, uh, where is it, 449 data points, uh, they inventory wells across the, the Arkansas side of the delta. And this is an indication of the depth to water, those cones of depression that Jason referred to this morning. Uh, we see one in the Grand Prairie, we see one in the, in the cache on the west side of Curlew's Ridge. So these reds, if most hydrologists use the same convention, red is bad, blue is good. Um, we're, we're seeing these red cones of depression um, equaling to about to 120 to 145 feet um, in, uh, to depth to water at that point. Um, so breaking that down a little bit further, uh, this is, uh, the count, these are the counties in the Grand Prairie, and we're looking at a 10-year change. So we'll look at both the Grand Prairie and the Cache uh, project area. We'll look at a 10-year change. We'll look at a one-year change. Because this, this really varies as, as depending on what, what years we're looking at. Um, so over the course of 10 years, we have about a 1.5-foot decline. These are those values, those 10-year values for each of those, each of those counties. Looking at it um, for just the one year from 2014 to 2015, which has a lot to do with 
How much did we, how much precipitation did we have during the production season, which relates to how much we irrigated during the production season? And then when did we have precipitation events and how did those precipitation events recharge that aquifer? So this is the Grand Prairie. Let's move a little bit um, to the north to the cache study area. So this is that 10 year decline. Uh, we're looking at about a six foot decline in the, the Cache River area. So these are the counties that are in that study area. So we're just looking at uh, these counties along the ridge on the west side of the ridge. And we see as much as 11.5 foot declines. And you know, that could be a function of where those wells are and, um, and how much pumping has been done at those, at those locations. But we, we see, you know, across the board, we say, you know, it's about a foot a year decline in the alluvial aquifer. But as you get at, to a much smaller spatial scale, we see those numbers getting a little bit bigger and bigger. So this is just an, an, an attempt to give you a sense of what that looks like um, a little in a, a little better detail. Um, so 14 to 15, we actually saw a, a slight increase. So again, we're at Lee over the course of 10 years, we, we lost about 11 feet. From 14 to 15, we gained about a foot. So there's a lot of variability but what we see consistently is over the course of time, we see that decline occurring. So back to this image, only because I wanted to highlight these cones of depression again in preparation for this image. Um, this is the percent of the Mississippi River alluvial aquifer that's saturated. So as you get these, bright, these redder colors, you have about 10, so this, this red is about 10 to 20% of the aquifer itself is actually saturated with water, right? So an aquifer is made up of, of sands and, and, and soils, space, and water. And so as, as we get less and less of that area is saturated, we see that really coinciding with these cones of depression here in the, in the cache and then here again in, uh, in the Grand Prairie. Um, this is an interesting image that <coughs> ANRC uh, presented last week that, that um, I wanted to borrow from, from Jim Batchel. Um, one of the things that I hadn't necessarily thought about, this is, an aquifer, this is a well that they've monitored since 1965. We see fairly steady declines, and then we see the somewhat bottoming out. <coughs> we attribute that to the fact that we're, we just have less and less water to lose, so that, that percent of saturation um, is, is getting so, so much smaller is that we, we don't have much further to go at this point. So we, that's why we see the settling out of the, the water depth. So this is the image that Jason shared with us this morning. Um, it, it's a model, right? It's, it's, a, it's a model and it's, uh, this is looking at 2007 data that was used to put into the NIRAS model. This is the projection of 2038 with business as usual. We see these cones of depression expanding, uh, particularly along uh, the, the Curly's Ridge. We see some of these cones, we see a cone moving into, into Missouri. We also see some um, depressions occurring on the east side of the ridge. Again, this is a model, but it's a, it's a predictive model that we, we need to be cognizant of and um, pay some credence to. Uh, so all of the, the points behind my kind of drilling down on the details of this aquifer decline is that we're fortunate that we have this, this alluvial aquifer as a source for irrigation. 97% of it is used for irrigation. We're also wildly fortunate that we get you know, 50 <laughs> inches of rain a year. But we need to use those resources a little bit more effectively to sustain our capacity to, to um, irrigate on into the future. Um, Thinking about the, the schematic that I put up at the, at the start, I want to get into a little bit of farm size and why water management is important as farms get bigger. 87% um, of Arkansas farmers farm more than 1,000 acres. 60% um, of them farm more than 2,000 <coughs> acres. So the efficiency of that management is really important. The incorporation of technology in that management is also really important, and we'll get into some of that. Um, so let's talk about which crops we're most interested in when we think about water. Uh, you know, as far as acres, we have a whole lot more soybeans in the state of Arkansas than we do any other, any other crop. Rice makes up about, um, let's say, just for even numbers, about a quarter of, of, that, of that acreage. When you layer on top of that the amount of water that's used to grow that crop, rice becomes nearly half of that, of that picture. So what we do with rice and how we manage rice 
um, is really important for, for the long-term sustainability of, of our agricultural communities. Uh, so let's look at rice. Um, one of the, the things that um, Lyle Pringle, who's a, an award recipient uh, at this conference this year, um, what he came up with is, is are some estimates of how land um, configuration impacts the amount of water that's needed for, for rice production. We've got contour levees here at about 44 acre inches. We stair step down as we get into straight levees, straight levees plus side inlet. Um, as we throw in, I'm sorry this is kind of dark here, but as we have straight levees, side inlet, and alternate wetting and drying, we can get into this band of about uh, you know, 14 to 25 acre inches. This is about 21, and then zero grade um, production is, is roughly about 20. So this is an idea of, of how um, just land form will really help us manage that water a little bit better. So this is back to that, that initial slide. Um, we've, we've drilled down enough, I think, about uh, groundwater decline. Uh, we've talked about water applied, the importance of rice, uh, taking us to this point, which really leads us to alternate wetting and drying. Um, I'll speak briefly about farm size, Murrow will as well, and then very briefly about technology. I'm not gonna spend too much time on greenhouse gases uh, for this talk. I, mean, what, I really wanted to focus on the water side of things. So alternate wetting and drying, um, how many of you are familiar with that term in rice, rice management? <coughs> Great. Um, so this, I think, is a really nice schematic that illustrates the differences between alternate wetting and drying and a continuously flooded field. Basically, you're gonna plant, um, drill seed your um, rice, and same thing with alternate wetting and drying, you're gonna, you're gonna dry seed um, your rice. At about four or five leaf stage, you'll flood it. You'll apply your nitrogen pre-flood, and then you'll flood it. Nothing is different until we get to this point. So after about two to three weeks of holding that flood on your field, maintaining your water levels to an appropriate conventional level, these two practices are very much exactly the same. Then the differences come after we have that two to three weeks of the flood being on the field. Um, then we allow that field to use the water that, that is in it. So we allow it, we're not saying release it and let it go down the ditch, we're saying use that water until you get down to a dry mud. And then depending on conditions, you may um, fill it back up and then let it dry again, depending on, on what's going on in here, till the latter part of the season where you're gonna again sustain that, that continuous flood until you release the flood for harvest and then harvest. Um, so this, slide has kind of bitten me in the past. Um, <coughs> there are many pros that have been done um, in relationship to alternate wetting and drying. Uh, we can reduce water use, we can reduce greenhouse gases, reduce arsenic, and also we have a potential for um, the carbon credits. Some of the um, generally held concerns about alternate wetting and drying is, um, you know, there's an increase in water management. You're no longer going to be able to tell your water person Go out there, keep a flood on there for the rest of the season. Boom. If there's not water in that field, then that person's not doing what they're supposed to do. Right? So you're really turning that management um, kind of on its head in a lot of ways. Uh, weed pressure is another cited concern, and then the impact on yield. Uh, these papers that have been kind of popping up under here are all um, peer-reviewed research that has been done in alternate wetting and drying. The majority of it has been done at the plot scale, a lot of it done by Dr. Anders and, um, and colleagues, showing um, we can, in fact, reduce greenhouse gases, arsenic, water use, um, and sustain yields uh, with this practice. So this is just a, a precursor to um, the study that I want to share with you uh, this morning um, was really an effort to take what they'd done at that plot scale and kind of scale it up. What does it look like when you're on a farm that has, you know, several thousand acres of rice and many other management concerns, you're not dealing with a small plot scale that you can, that you, can you know, more or less babysit um, more readily than you can when you're, when you're in, the, in the larger scale application. Um, so we wanted to, to find a producer that um, had these particular characteristics, most importantly, a place where we could, we could pump quickly and not get too behind um, if we got things too dry. We wanted to be at a place that had pretty good weed control. We didn't want to start out with a real weedy site. 
Um, and then also sites that either had straight levees or zero grade just for the control, and then also a site where we would put out most of our nitrogen pre-flood. So we found that site with um, working with Mike and Ryan Sullivan at the Florida Farm. Um, so this is a map of the U.S. Uh, Little Rock's here at the Star. We're looking in the northeastern corner. Um, their farm is in Mississippi County, uh, not too far from the Boot Heel and just north of Osceola. Um, so they farm about 12,000 acres, give or take, um, predominantly rice, <coughs> lots of lot soybeans, and then wheat in the winter. So we're going to talk about what we did at that farm in 2015 and 2016. Uh, for those of you who have heard my talk from last year, this is just a quick synthesis of that, and then we'll get on to, on to the 20, 2016 uh, work that, that we did. So what we did is took 18 production-sized fields and paired them and then randomly assigned what treatment they got. The treatment was either alternate wetting and drying or conventional. Uh, these six fields were zero grade fields. These 12 were precision leveled fields. These six were about 50 acres. These six were about 75 acres for round numbers. Uh, this is the production practice that, that occurred during that season. All of the fields were in XL 753. Uh, planted in late March, early April. Uh, we had a real wet spring, so we, we, the, uh, the nitrogen was flown on. There was no application of uh, fungicide and insecticide. Uh, we <coughs> flooded late May um, and had one, one uh, significant drain down event in the alternate wetting and drying fields. We'll see that in the next slide. Um, the fields were drained uh, in early August in preparation for harvest in late August. So this is an image of one of those fields. Uh, we've got the date on the x-axis, water depth on, the y, on, the, on this y-axis, and then the bars are rainfall uh, with, with this axis. So what we're looking at is um, the, this is the water depth tracked by two different methodologies. One was uh, a human and the other one was a sensor. Uh, what we see is that during this early part of July, we had a dry down event. And so what did that look like across the board? Um, the yield showed no significant difference between the conventionally flooded fields and the alternate wetting and drying fields. Um, we, we see these are basically and, and pretty much the same statistically. Um, these yields were generated using truck weights. Um, and uh, I can't say enough about working with the Sullivans and uh, all of the pain that I caused them to, to have to do that. Um, looking at total water applied, and this is one of the things I, th I think that's really a take home message when we move to this larger scale. Um, managing these, these fields can be difficult depending on how much control you have. So across the board, we had nine field pairs, right? Two of them went in the wrong direction. Um, two of them were less than 5% different. Um, I'm missing two of them, the 23 and the 93 were in the wrong direction. Um, so then we're down to these two, um, were just less, they were essentially the same. And then we had four other fields that ranged between 25 and 47% different with the alternate wetting and drying using 25 to 40% less water um, in them. When you break it down to just when we had this treatment um, occur between late June and early July, this is where the difference in that applied water really came in. Um, but the challenge that we saw with some of um, how the water was managed was that once it was dry, they really build it back up and put way too much water um, for, the, for the tail end of the season. So it really kind of flushed out some of those differences that we saw during the, during the treatment difference, but it didn't pan out over the whole season. So um, milling quality, uh, we worked with Dr. Stephen Morgan at the University of Arkansas. Again, we see no difference in the um, milled rice yield, the head rice yield, and the milling quality of the, those six 50-acre fields in the bottom. There was no significant difference. Um, then we, we had a, um, a challenge in terms of, of harvesting. Um, those six fields were harvested early. And again, that's here showing that there's no significant difference. Um, we had a rain event, and then we had a later harvest. Those last 12 fields were harvested late, and we start to see a, a difference in the milled rice yield and the head rice yield in the precision leveled, those six precision leveled fields, where we saw no difference in the zero grade fields that were harvested late. So this is something that, that we were um, worried and, and concerned about, uh, but we think that a lot of it had to do with the conditions under which they were, they were harvested. Um, arsenic, um, the, 
level, the codex level for polished rice is 0.2 parts per million, um, 0.1 for uh, baby food. All of these values um, for the milled, because this is this value is for milled rice, so this is brown rice over here, um, are below that 0.1 value. Uh, but we do see a reduction when we get into the alternate wetting and drying compared to the conventional. So if arsenic is a concern for you, um, doing alternate wetting and drying will, will bring, those, bring those values down. And this is a statistically significant difference between uh, the alternate wetting and drying and the conventionally flooded fields. Uh, we also measured greenhouse gases uh, using static vented chambers. Um, that's what this data are showing. So the flooded field had about two times the amount of methane uh, generated uh, compared to the alternate wetting and drying field. So that's what this is showing. We can see this reduction here um, during that drying event in, um, in late July. So moving on to 2016, we got a little bit, um, a, a little bit excited about, about doing what we were doing. So we had to um, find 18 fields. Uh, these six are the same. They're zero grade, so they're not, con they're not um, rotated into soybeans. Everything else, the other 12 were in soybeans, so we couldn't use those as a replicate. So we moved to the north side of the, of the highway, and um, we gained these uh, one, two, three, four, five, six other pairs. You notice some different colors. Uh, the orange uh, was, a, was a test on uh, doing some row rice work. Um, Ryan Sullivan is presenting uh, that work at this conference if you want to, to track him down. Um, he'll talk to you about the differences in cost for the farm um, in relationship to, uh, to the row rice that, that we tested out. And then this set of 40 was really a, a test of cascade row, alternate wetting and drying, and conventionally flooded field on this, on this set of 40. So in the end, we ended up with 18 fields once you exclude everything that's orange and its orange neighbor. Uh, we have 18 fields with 981 acres. Um, 12 of them are precision <coughs> leveled. These six are zero grade. Again, our focus was um, the alternate wetting and drying compared to the conventional. These are the particulars. We had a, we had a nicer spring, so we were able to ground apply. Um, the nitrogen at these rates uh, using NSTAR to determine which, which rate was used at each of the individual fields. Same variety across all, one th all, uh, all fields that were studied. <coughs> it was planted a lot earlier between the 22nd and 23rd of March. Uh, we did have some herbicide applications. We flooded in mid-May. We drained in early August and harvested again in late August. So the um, fields that we're going to talk about to compare the alternate wetting and drying versus conventional are these four pair. Um, the others didn't behave as they were supposed to, um, either because the management was switched or it, there weren't any drying events that occurred in these four. Um, we had some well <coughs> issues at these two pairs and at these two pairs. So we're gonna focus on these four, uh, these four pairs, which covers about 500 acres. So, Looking at those four fields, uh, we see no statistical difference in the yields. Um, slightly better yields than the 2016 values, um, but I mean, we can't really get that much uh, the same um, comparing 200 to 200 uh, as far as yield on um, the, the average for, for these four pair uh, fields. Looking at water applied, we saw a reduction in the amount of water applied in the alternate wetting and drying. Most of that comes from this difference. There's about a 44% difference from in, in this pair. This is about 6% in the wrong direction. And these two are just under 10% different between the conventional and the alternate wetting and drying. But statistically, as far as water applied, there were, there were no differences. Looking at uh, water use efficiency, uh, grain per water applied, you know, if we can, if we can produce grain but we use a whole lot of water, then, you know, we're not really getting to, getting to the goal that, that we're attempting to get to. Um, we see much more grain with less water um, at the alternate wetting and drying fields compared to the conventional, but again, no statistical difference. And that's really where, where this comes out. You know, we used a lot of water, but their yields were basically the same. So that's where these values start to show us really what, what, we're, actually, what we're actually getting. Looking at milling, uh, the milling values were, were not great. Again, we had some late season moisture that, that really impacted things. Statistically, they're not different. We do see, again, this reduction in milling. Um, milled rice yield in two of these fields. Head rice yield is, is the same. Statistically, they're not different, but 
um, this, this kind of jumps, jumps out at you. Um, so in conclusion, as far as the work that we've done in alternate wetting and drying, um, there is an increase in the amount of management that has to go into these fields. Um, and Merle will talk, will talk a bit more about this, um, but the amount of control that you have incorporating some technology, we'll look at that on the next slide, um, will, I think, help us in the end. Um, really, the yield the, uh, and the milling values that we see from these fields in 2015 and 2016 are not statistically different. Um, and we did see a, a reduction in the greenhouse gases and the arsenic from the 2015 data. Um, the challenges that we saw is really this, this control um, of water management and the communication between what's going on in the field and who's turning on and off the wells um, is a huge part of, of this practice. Um, so we've been working on for the last several years how we can do that uh, remotely and it's not as easy as you would think um, working in wet, dirty, uh, locations in rice fields compared to the lab. In the lab, it works really nicely. Um, and I have a PhD student who keeps banging his head <laughs> against the wall um, and says, you know, it works lovely in the field. When you, you know, hit it with solar radiation all day, it's wet, it's moist. Um, electronics are not particularly happy in those kind of conditions. So we, we have been making some strides, but it's not, you know, foolproof and um, something that's, that's really easy to, uh, to incorporate. So this water level monitoring, I know um, King from Mississippi has been doing a lot, of, a lot of that work, and I believe he's presenting at the conference today. Uh, this is some imagery from um, those same fields we just talked about um, from satellite images and some remote sensing folks that we're working with in Beltsville. Again, trying to, trying to figure out how can we make this decision making easier? How can we make the water management easier um, with what kind of tools we, we can incorporate? Um, there, there was a group uh, of folks with uh, UAVs that came to Mike's farm and uh, showed us some pretty whizzy tools, but I'm not sure how, how, far, that's, how far that's moving. Uh, we'll continue to analyze this data and um, hope to incorporate more of those fields, but in the interest of, of this particular talk, I wanted to kind of focus on the ones that were assigned and behaved as, as they were supposed to. Um, in 2017, we will move to this um, block of fields um, there are 1640s, um, each with individual uh, wells in each of the middle of, of the 40s. So we'll have four different blocks. Um, in each of those blocks, we hope to have an alternate wetting and drying, a conventional field, a row field, and a cascade field uh, to really kind of get to uh, some of those details of how water management related to these impacts greenhouse gases, impacts ammonia and nitrous, uh, nitrous oxide release, um, particularly with, with that first flood of um, water with the first application of nitrogen. So with that, we'll move to Merle. Thank you, Michelle. Um, do we have some rice growers in here? 